It is a, a great pleasure to, to be here and uh, I'll also will be announcing a, a major change in policy uh, on behalf of the in regard to the flags during the course of the speech. Just to <laughs> make sure you don't drift off. Um, so let me uh, start by congratulating uh, the Flag Institute for the first 40 years. Uh, 40 years as a respected source of help and advice, not just to the United Kingdom government, uh, but also to the United Nations and to other organisations throughout the world. 40 years of bringing together enthusiasts, educating people and spreading uh, the, the knowledge. I wouldn't of course claim to have um, any of the expertise that uh, my, my neighbour uh, um, uh, from Romford House or from Yoga South, but I think I do share some of your enthusiasm. Um, the flag deserves respect. They can exercise great power, rallying people behind a cause, inspiring pride, but more important, the outpouring of joy and celebrations. The power of flags to move people is written deep into our culture, everywhere from the Old Testament to Shakespeare. And they matter as much now as they did in the past. They give people a way of saying, we belong. Whether it's to our nation or to our county. A flag is an object of pride and joy. At the royal wedding, we saw flags in abundance. Now, they might have been the incorrect colour, they might have been the incorrect size, um, they might have been produced in Hong Kong, but nevertheless, they were there. Flags representing the home countries of visitors uh, from across the world joining in our celebration. And our own flag, Union flag, St. George's flag, the Welsh dragon, the Salter. They display our flags is a symbol of our shared nation, celebrating what makes the place we love distinct, special, and unique. We shouldn't be afraid of this sense of pride. We should join in the celebration. Now, of course, not everyone agrees. Let's say we're St. George's Day. Each year, there are a small number of sports clubs in councils and other public institutions who don't want to fly the St. George's Cross. They say it's health and safety. It might put someone else, someone's eye out. They say it's cultural awareness and equality rules. Somebody, somewhere, might be offended. <clears throat> well, I'm not convinced by either of these explanations. The real reason that some people despise the outpouring of national pride. And some people are nervous because some extremist group have tried to wrap themselves in the flag. It's a straightforward hijack attempt. Now, I don't think the answer is to wring our hands, to say just take it away or it's all just a little bit too difficult. The answer is to say this is our flag. It belongs to everyone. We'll take it back. It will be a disgrace <coughs> to leave the, the flag in the hands of people who want to put democracy asunder or who judge people by the colour of their skin or by their religion. When the fact is, our and local national flags unite people of every creed, every class, and every colour. Community cohesion is strengthened, not undermined by flying the flag. That's why my department has stood up for common sense as far as flags are concerned. We may declare that at moments of national pride and celebration, the Royal Wedding, St George's Day, the World Cup, the winning of the Ashes, people should feel free to celebrate by flying the flag. 
and public institutions should support them. As well as national symbols, flags can be powerful ways of celebrating local pride and local identity. At my department, we've made a point of flying county flags of England, a different one every week. We celebrate the astonishing variety of different counties, from the bars of uh, Northumberland to St. Pennant <coughs> Cross of Cornwall. Next week, we'll be flying the flag of Middlesex. Middlesex may be an historic county, not a current unit of local government administration but it retains its place in people's memories and people's affections, despite attempts that have been made to wipe it off the face of the map. It's hardly surprising when historic English counties are one of the oldest forms of local government in Western Europe. Their roots run deep. No amount of administrative reshuffling can delete their long-standing and cherished local identities. Neither Middlesex, nor the ridings of Yorkshire, nor people's sense of belonging to them can be abolished by a stroke of the bureaucrat's pen. In fact, we're seeing an interest in county flags grow. As you know, Nottinghamshire held a Poll last month in adopting a new county flag. That's a symbol of the enduring strength of county identity compared to so called government regions, on which uh, uh, the last administration was so desperately keen. They erected a complex, costly apparatus of regional bodies, regional development agencies, regional assemblies the office of the region. Unelected, unaccountable, and striking for in accord with the people that they were supposed to serve. When asked, the case for regional government was overwhelmingly rejected by the people in the 2004 referendum on the North East Assembly. Most people identify with their nation their town, city, and their county, not with artificial government regions. And bureaucrats' imagination did not stop at designing English regions. If only that was the case, I think I'd be very happy. Now, if you were asked where you are today, you might say, well, I'm in the United Kingdom, or I'm in London. Um, and if you perhaps were wanting to impress your neighbours, you'd tell them that you went to the snallyest part of London to Mayfair. But it's my duty to inform you that you are in fact in La Zone Transmanche. As part of the Interreg programme, the European Union have invented transnational regions. One of these, the Arc Manche, is designed to merge English counties on the south coast the departments in France. The Marche of course, uh, Marche of course, uh, what we call the English Channel. But the words English Channel have been replaced on the EU uh, with the English phrase, the Channel Sea. Ten billions of, tens of millions of pounds of taxpayers' money have been spent on propaganda to build a sense of identity for the art Marche. The multi-million project includes spending public money on transnational street feet, <laughs> on cross-channel contemporary contours, and the most mystifying of all, a series of cross-channel cycle lanes. <laughs> <laughs> Now, unless I've missed some significant advances in bicycle design, I <laughs> have a real struggle to see how this might work. Uh, the, uh, the Art Manche has even its own area. According to its designers, its concentric rings, symbolising the flow of projects and stakeholders, 
and representatives to some to so many bridges between the territories. Well, to you and me, it might look like ever de decreasing circles. <laughs> This government will be making it very clear this opposition to the invention and promotion of artificial regions at public expense, uh, be they European or be they homegrown. Get cuts, encourage uh, cooperation between our uh, neighbours um, and our, our friends uh, in the European Union and the Commonwealth. But there is no need to create an entirely separate region to do that. Now that more eagle-eyed of you will notice that this week, outside my department, we're not flying an historic uh, county flag. Uh, we're flying the flag of the European Union, European Union instead. Is this some kind of spontaneous outpouring? <coughs> well, not quite. My department manages the European Regional Development Fund. Because of this, Article 7 of EU Regulations 1828 stroke 2006 requires that we fly the European flag during European Week, which will have many of a joyous celebration. <laughs> <laughs> if we fail to do so, we will be fined. As do other organisations who, re who receive or manage Europe, let the light come out indeed, and manage uh, European funding. So we'll fly the flag, and we'll cash the cheque. <laughs> but any organisation that forces others to fly the flag betrays a lack of confidence and a deep sense of political insecurity. Will forcing people to fly the flag help balance the EU budget? No. Will it make the money go further? No. <coughs> Will it make the European flag more popular? No. Flying a flag should be a pleasure, not a joy. So it's not so much the ode to joy, more, oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> Normal service will resume next week when we fly the Middlesex flag to celebrate Middlesex Day. And by the way, this is uh, very aptly, we will be celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Albahera, where the Middlesex Regiment held back Napoleon in the Peninsular War, fighting off an attempt at European dictatorship. <laughs> it's become more, it's because they are powerful, they're so powerful that the flags deserve our respect. It's right that we have rules setting out how and when different flags should be used. But today, I think it's time to look again at some of these rules and to start to liberate these rules. As you know, there are a number of flags that can be flown without having to ask for express advertisement consent. They include national flags, county flags, uh, and, the, uh, and the Commonwealth flags, EU and uh, UN flags. To fly the flags, we have to apply for consent. This costs up to £335 a time. But surely, there are times when it should be appropriate to let people fly other flags without requiring application. But what about Armed Forces Day? Or Washington School want to celebrate its local regiment. And what about an Australian pub who might want to fly the Queensland flag to show solidarity with people affected by the floods? Or the university who might want to honour a foreign exchange student by flying a flag of St. Prague? Why is it that we can only fly county flags? What about borough flags or city flags? Surely it's right that these things should be, uh, should be encouraged and we should require special uh, thanks, uh, special permission to do so. So, I intend to start a consultation uh, later this year, which actually means pretty soon after I finish making the speech, about whether and how we should extend the, the group of flags. Uh, what that uh, can be flown without requiring consent. Making it easier for people to celebrate an identity and an organisation that means something for them. 
there will be some important questions to think about, about how exactly we might extend the rules, about what say, it means to councils who have to enforce these. And we would, of course, make sure that people would not be able to fly uh, the flags without owners' permissions. Nor will this be a cheap way around advertising rules for, for various companies. So I think we need a, a foolish debate. And I hope the Institute, um, with its wealth of expertise, will be able not just to play a part in the debate, so we're not looking for, for consultation, we're actually asking for something much more fundamental. We'd like you to help us make sure that we're actually asking the right questions in the first place. I've begun by saying that um, flags deserve respect. The UK is, is very lucky in having this institute, a group of dedicated and informed people who do a great deal to make sure that respect is given to flags and to symbols of our nation and our communities. Your first 40 years, you've established your credentials, not just in this country, but on the world stage. So let's talk about the next 40 years. There can be no doubt that you will continue to grow from strength to strength. So, on behalf of the government, I wish you every success. I look forward to the chance to continue to talk with you and to work with you, particularly in these exciting months ahead. Thank you very much.